1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 14. Just one, one verse to get started this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and I'll get there. This is on the page in my Bible that is that flitters around sometimes. So, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 14. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. Let's bow our hearts now in a word of prayer. Our God and Father, again we do thank you for Jesus Christ and for the opportunity of looking to your word this morning and studying it together. And as we do so, we pray that the things said and done would honor and glorify the name of Christ that would be edifying to the saints. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right, um, this morning, <coughs> excuse me, we want to um, talk a little bit about idolatry and kind of in light of the season that we're in now and the giving of life, Jesus Christ coming to this earth uh, as a man, um, God giving life to that, that baby who then grew up to become our Savior on the cross. Um, you know, I, I saw, I don't know if any of you saw a story this week, there was a some homeowners association, some, I don't even remember where now, out west, down south, I don't know. Um, where was it? One of the one of the Carolinas. Okay, you, you must have seen this too. So um, so they they the homeowners association has real strict rules about what kind of decorations you can put up, how long they're allowed to stay up, this and that, blah blah blah. So the so one of the people in the in the development or whatever, as part of their Christmas display, put up a cross, and the homeowners association said. You can't put up a cross for a Christmas display because a, the cross has nothing to do with Christmas. Um, and so you can put up the, a baby in the manger and all that stuff, but you can't put up a cross. Now at Easter you can put up a cross, but you can't put up a cross at Christmas time. And I thought, well, isn't that anyhow? Um, but the, I guess the, the point, what made me think of that is that we, we all understand that the baby in the manger really is not the point of Jesus Christ coming to the earth. It's the Christ on the cross um, that died for our sins. He came to this earth, was born, became a man so that he could die for our sins. So if you don't end the Christmas story with the cross, you really haven't accomplished much. And that's what we should do at this time of year always is, is use the opportunity when people are focused on Christ and on his, his birth. Um, use that opportunity to talk about, well, you know, he, he, didn't, he wasn't just born, he also died. And he died in a very, very different way. Maybe next week we'll talk about Paul's Christmas message in Philippians 2 and, and how Paul ties those two things together. But for today, we want to, to speak on the topic, giving God a lift. And um, so, so when we think about Christmas and, you know, some people, like, you know, we have poinsettias here and Christmas trees and all that. And, and there are some people that, that kind of, think that that's idolatrous and you know whatever and we'll talk about that a little bit this morning and what idol worship in scripture really was and then how does that apply to us today what is it that we would do today that would be the equivalent of Israel or the pagans or whoever worshiping idols so first of all let's talk a little bit about God go back to um, Exodus chapter 20 Scripture presents God in, in a very unique way, and um, we've talked about this before uh, in the context of old the Old Testament scriptures, how that many times God is named, um, and the, as, as is the case here in Exodus chapter 20, verse number 1, and God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the house of Egypt, uh, uh, out of the land of Egypt, rather, out of the house of bondage, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that's in heaven above or that is in earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them for the Lord, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and the fourth generation of them that hate me. So scripture presents God, the God of the Bible, the God of scripture, the God of Israel, the God of the church, the body of Christ as a unique and jealous solitary being. Um, if you notice verse 2, I am the Lord thy God. And every time you see the word Lord in all capital letters in your King James Bible, of course we know it's a translation of the name of God, Jehovah. So many, many times in the Old Testament, 
we'll read about Jeho I am Jehovah thy God. And then again down in verse number five, for I, Jehovah thy God, am a jealous God. When God, when we read the creation account in Genesis chapter one and two, uh, oftentimes that's the phrase that's used, the Lord, Jehovah thy God. So um, it's, it's all about which God uh, and the God of the Bible is a specific God. When we hear, for instance, today, well, Allah is just the Arabic word for God. Um, that's not really technically true. Now, if you say Allah is the Arabic word for God, that's the same as saying Jehovah is the Hebrew word for God, which again is not, yes, the Hebrews called their God Jehovah, but why? Because that was his name, Jehovah the God, Jehovah is God, the Lord God, Jehovah God, and Muslims call their God Allah, so that has become their name for God, but it's a name. Gods have names, um, Jehovah, Baal, Ashtaroth, uh, Allah, um, you know, the, the Hindus have three million gods, they all have names. So the name of God is important, and you, as you go through scripture, you'll find the name of God, the name of God, at the name of God, at the name of Jesus. So the name is important. And in this passage, it's the name, Jehovah God, uh, thou shalt have no other gods before me. If you go to 1 Timothy chapter 1, and you kind of bring that up into the dispensation of grace, and what Paul has to say about it, 1 Timothy chapter 1, he refers to the one true God also. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 17, Now unto the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. The only wise God. So the, 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 the God of the Bible is a God that is unique. He's a God that's a jealous God. He's a God that has a name. It's, G, it's, it's Jehovah. It's Jesus Christ. It's the King, eternal, immortal, invisible. Um, Paul calls him in 1 Corinthians 8. We'll see in a few minutes, the Father. He calls Jesus Christ the Lord. So all those terms are terms that are used to describe the God of the Bible, the God that the Bible presents, the God that Genesis through Revelation is focused on. Now, the thing about that God that is different than all the other gods is that the God of the Bible is alive. Let's go back to um, 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17. Just pick up some of the, these Old Testament passages. This, this morning is going to be kind of like a, a, a Bible drill. Remember when you were a kid, maybe, you know, you used to have Bible drills where you know, a guy would stand up front, give a verse, and who can find the verse first and all that kind of stuff. Nobody ever did that. Uh, yeah, some people did that. All right. Okay, so that's what we're doing this morning, except I won't make you raise your hand when you find the verse. All right, just find it whatever you find it. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 26. 1 Samuel 17, 26. Um, and David spake unto the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine, and taketh away this reproach of Israel, from Israel? So, of course, the context here is, you know, Goliath has come out, he's defying the armies of, of Israel, and David is saying, so who, who's going to go out there and, and face this guy? Uh, and the rest of verse 26, For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And, and again and again and again, you know, there are some things in Scripture that, you know, maybe they're mentioned one or two times, and, and so that's good. You know, and if the Bible says it once, it's true, just remember that. But there are things in Scripture that keep coming up again and again and again and again, and, and you kind of get the idea, maybe this is important, because God says it like 400 and 89 times. And one of those phrases that he says again and again and again is the living God, the living God, the living God. So if the, if the fact that the true God of the Bible is the living God, if that's important, then it's, it, what's that say about all the other gods? If calling him the living God distinguishes him from all the others, then what's true of the others? They're dead gods, that's right. If, if there's one living God and all the others are not living, if that distinguishes the one he's talking about, then it's because the other gods are dead. Um, go to Jeremiah chapter 10. Jeremiah chapter 10. And uh, Jeremiah chapter 10, uh, we read, and this is one of the passages that people kind of look at and say, well, that's, that's a Christmas tree. You've got to be careful of those Christmas trees. So um, we'll read it. But I, I think it's interesting what the, the, the scriptures say here about 
other gods. Jeremiah 10, 1, Hear ye the word which the Lord speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, Learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. For the customs of the people are vain. For one cutteth a tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the or the, the work of the hands of the workmen with the, the axe. They deck it with silver and with gold. They fasten it with nails and with hammers, uh, that it move not. They are upright as a palm tree. They speak not. They must needs be born, because they cannot go. Be not afraid of them, for they cannot do evil, neither also is it in them to do good. For as much as there is none like unto thee, O Lord, and O Lord in all capital letters, Jehovah, thou art great, and thy name is great in might. So here's a description of the God of the, the gods of the heathens. They cut a tree. It's the, the, the work of the workmen. They deck it with silver and gold. They fasten it with nails and with hammers that it move not. They must needs be born because they cannot go. Be not afraid of them. In other words, Jeremiah is sort of, uh, sort of uh, mocking here the gods of, of the nations. They must needs be born because they cannot go. So if you've got God on your kitchen table and you want to go to the living room, how, how's God going to get there? You have to take him there. So that's why the, the message, giving God a lift, because we've got to take him to the living room. So if you have a God, if you serve a God that can't make it from the kitchen to the living room on his own, and, and he says, be not afraid of them. Why, why are you afraid of a God that you can't even, that can't even make it from one room to the other? And, you know, that, that brings up, and we're, we're really not going to look at a lot of verses like this this morning, but that brings up a point. There is a phrase also, just like the living God, that is used throughout Scripture, and that is the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord, the fear of the Lord. What's he say about these other gods? Be not afraid of them. <laughs> but now the Lord, Jehovah, yeah, that's the one you want to fear. But be not afraid of these other gods, because they, they must needs be born. They cannot go, for they, they cannot do evil, neither also it is, is it in them to do good. So these gods that are not alive, and that's really the key here. These are gods that are not alive. Turn to the book of Daniel chapter 6. And if you remember Daniel, King Darius um, throws Daniel into the lion's den and you know you know the, the story from uh, you know from the time you were knee high to a grasshopper that Daniel's in the lion's den. God comes and shuts the lion's mouths. And one of the things that that illustrated, in fact, the thing that it illustrated is this. Daniel chapter 6 and verse number 20, uh, and well, verse 19. And the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste unto the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried with a lamentable voice unto Daniel. And the king spake and said to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the, what? Living God is thy God whom thou servest continually able to deliver thee from the lions. Then said Daniel unto the king, O king, live forever. My God has sent his angel and has shut the lions' mouths that they have not hurt me. For as much as before him innocency was found in me and also before thee, O king, I have done no hurt. Down to verse 25. Then King Darius wrote unto all people, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied unto you. I make a decree that in every, every domain of my kingdom, men tremble and what? Fear before the God of Daniel. What did, what did he say in Jeremiah about those other gods? You don't, don't, don't be afraid of them. Here Darius, a Gentile, says, hey, here's the God you want to fear. This one that Daniel serves, he's the real deal. And you want to fear him. Fear uh, the, 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 before the God of Daniel. For, why would you fear that one? He is the what? living God. Because he's a God that's actually alive. Those other ones that can't get from the kitchen to the living room on their own, they're just dead. They're just pieces of wood or silver or gold. But here's a God that is actually alive. Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. We talk about the Thessalonians often and um, <clears throat> how they were an exemplary assembly. And when Paul writes to the church at Thessalonica for the first time, and he talks about them turning to God, uh, it's interesting the way he puts it. Verse 7, So that ye, speaking of the church at Thessalonica, this is 1 Thessalonians 1, 7, So that ye were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. 
For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God were to spread abroad, so that we need not to speak anything. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye turned to God from idols to serve what? The living and true God. So you serve, God is not just a, 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 a thing, he's a living being. And you turned from idols to serve the living and true God. Now, along with the fact that God is a living God, he also has the ability to give life, which makes him an even, because we are living beings, but we can't take an inanimate, lifeless thing like that chair and make it alive. But God not only is alive, but he gives life. Go all the way back to Genesis chapter 2. And you know, I'm sure you know the verse already that we're going to. But it certainly is, is a place in scripture that you point to and say, well, yeah, now there, that's a, 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 something amazing that God can do. Genesis 2, 7 and the Lord God, again, Lord in all capital letters. In this creation account, um, it, 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 God, again and again, verse, um, verse 5, well, you can go, go before that even, verse 4, the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. <clears throat> in the middle of verse 5, the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth. In verse 7, the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. Verse 8, and the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. Verse 9, and out of the ground made the Lord God to grow everything. Um, uh, so again and again, <laughs> down in verse 15, and the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden. Verse 16, and the Lord God commanded the man, saying, verse 18, and the Lord God said, every one of those places, it's, it's God making sure you understand who is the God that's doing this. It's Jehovah. It's not Allah. It's not Ashtaroth. It's not Baal. It's not any of the gods of the Hindus. It is Jehovah God. It's the God of the Hebrews. His name is Jehovah, and he's the one that did all this stuff. So no matter how many legends there are about what how mankind got here and all the rest, there is one God that did all this. It's Jehovah God. And verse 7, Jehovah God, the Lord God, formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a what? Living soul. So we can't, we can't do that. You know, take an inanimate object, go out there, you know, gather up some mud, breathe into it, and have it become a living soul. But God is a God that not only has life, but can give life. He can impart that life to something that was lifeless. The life that we impart as through procreation, is, that's really just the life that God gave initially, right? It's just passing that life on to a future generation. We're not taking something that's dead, inanimate, and making it alive. We're just creating life. We're bringing life from something that's already alive. God took something that was dead, formed man of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. That's important. That's big time stuff that you can just give life to something. Um, on, if you watch Star Trek, any one of the, <clears throat> in the newer Star Treks, one of the things is, when, when, because they have these androids that are, you know, very lifelike, you'd think they're real people and all that. And, and one of the big questions is, when does that android, when does that, that robot become a, and their term is, sentient being? Because one is have self-awareness. Well, the Bible's word for that is living soul. <laughs> living, which is a lot easier to understand than sentient being. Um, but, but only God, we can, no matter how advanced our technology gets, that thing that we create, that thing that we build, really, don't create it, we just build it from stuff that's already here, will never have a living soul. That is, be a sentient being. Because it's not, because it, it, it doesn't have the life that can only come from the life giver, from the creator. That's where life comes from. Um, go to First Chronicles chapter 16. First Chronicles 16. 
Uh, this idea that he's a giver of life, just like the fact that he's a living God, and that runs throughout the scriptures, and it's again and again and again in the scriptures, so is this idea that he is a giver of life. 1 Chronicles 16, um, verse number 25, For great is the Lord, 1 Chronicles 16, 25, Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He also is to be feared above all gods. Remember, there, there's that fear again. Be not afraid of these idols. What, who do you be afraid of? The true God. He's to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the people are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. The Lord created. The Lord is the one from whom the universe, um, by whom the universe exists. He's the one that created it. He's the one that gave life, that put everything here that's here. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Paul talks about the... Uh, the Lord, I mentioned this earlier, the Father, and the one Father and one Lord, 1 Corinthians 8 and verse number 4, 1 Corinthians 8, 4, as concerning therefore the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, <clears throat> we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is none other God but one. For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords many, but to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. There is one God, he's the Father, and it's of whom are all things. All that is, is here because of him. And there's one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things. He created all things by Jesus Christ, the book of Hebrews says. So he's the creator. If you go back to long ago, we talked about the master architect, the master builder, the master craftsman. God the Father is the master architect, by whom are, 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 uh, of whom are all things. Jesus Christ, the master builder, by whom are all things. If you go back to the book of Acts, it's interesting, when Paul, when Paul begins his ministry to the Gentiles, and Acts chapter 14 is, is the first real, you know, as, as he gets out among the Gentiles, this Acts 13 and 14 is his first apostolic journey. And it's where he goes to Lystra and Derbe and Iconium, and he's stoned in Lystra, and then he comes, he, he's raised from the dead uh, and goes on with his ministry. In that journey, and as he's out among the Gentiles really for the first time, and begins to establish the churches of the Gentiles, the thing that he has to start with, verse 11 of Acts 14, and when the people saw what Paul had done, that is, he healed the lame man, when the people saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in the speech of Lyconia, the gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. Then they called Barnabas Jupiter and Paul Mercurius because he was the chief speaker. So if you remember back from Greek mythology, Jupiter, Mercury, those gods, and they had idols and they had altars and you know, Poseidon was the god of the sea and, and, and all, these, all these gods uh, that you studied when you studied mythology. These people, see they didn't study this as, oh that's Greek mythology. They, they studied that as, these are our gods. And so they think Paul and Barnabas are Jupiter and Mercury. Verse 13, the priest of Jupiter, which was before their city, brought oxen and garlands under the gates and would have done sacrifice uh, with the people. We're going to sacrifice to Paul and Barnabas. <clears throat> and people still do that one. Years back when I went with Dan to India, Every, every shrine, every temple you go in, there's all these statues. The big one is the elephant god. Everywhere you go, there's an, el an elephant sitting there, you know, like. And, and around all of those statues, there's all this fruit and food, rotten food. Why? Because we're bringing this stuff to those gods. Well, obviously, those gods can't eat it. So it just, it, you know, it's just so. So in a country where people starve, we're just laying this food there. You know, for these, these gods that can't see, can't hear, can't eat that fruit. And that's what's going on here. They're going to do sacrifice. Verse 14, <clears throat> which when the apostles 
Barnabas and Paul heard of, they rent their clothes and <clears throat> ran in among the people crying out and saying, Sirs, why do ye these things? We also are men of like passions with you and preach unto you that ye should turn from these vanities unto what? The living God. Remember I said how that, that, just, that theme runs through scripture. And when Paul, as he encounters these heathens, these pagans, every time, that's the, it's the, he's the living, you should turn from these vanities. These silly, superstitious vanities of worshiping these gods that are dead. And you should serve the living God. And, and not only is he the living God, but which made heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are therein. You realize how he's, he's, he's uh, attacking those gods, Jupiter and Mercury and Poseidon, you know, because there's, there's the god of the sea and the god of the earth and the god of the sky and all, all this pagan idolatry stuff. And, and then Paul says, hey, hey, what about the god that made heaven and earth and sea. And that's really the three realms that, that in, in pagan heathen theology, well, there's the God of the sky and the God of, and some, some pagan theology even says that is the gods, the sky and the earth and the, the, the sea. Those are the three gods. And Paul, Paul, Paul goes right at that and says, hey, 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 there's a God that is alive. And not only is he alive, but he made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all things that are therein. That's the God. That's the God I present to you. That's the God you need to worship. The living God that made everything that there is. Go to Acts 17. Acts 17, a different occasion, but the same kind of an audience. He's in Athens, he's on Mars Hill, uh, verse 22, Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. So Paul is, is, is going around uh, in Athens and he sees all these idols and he sees these altars with all this stuff offered to these gods. And then he finds this altar that says to the... Un so, so Athens, Greece, that's all these gods, right? That's Jupiter and Mercury and Poseidon and, and, and Hercules and wh whoever all these gods. There's altars to all these gods. And then there's one in case we forgot one. In case there's one we don't know, this is the unknown God. And Paul, it, 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 Paul was so uh, adept at, of course, I mean, it, it helps when you have the Holy Spirit you know, telling you what to say. But he was so good at, at taking the situation, the circumstance, and just going right. Like, they're going to worship, back in Acts 14, they're going to worship him as gods. The God of the, sun, the, the, the earth and the God of the heavens and all that. And he goes right at them and says, hey, hey. Let me tell you about the God that made the heaven and the earth and the sea. And here, they've got this altar to the unknown God, and he says, you know that one you don't know? <laughs> I'll tell you about the one you don't know. <laughs> He's really the only one that matters. Verse, the end of verse 23, Whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, you don't know who he is, him declare I unto you, the one you don't know. God that made the world and all things therein, Seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with men's hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. He, he giveth to all, what? Life and breath and all. And if you can give life, if you can take something that's dead and make it alive, something that's inanimate and make it animate, something that is a non-sentient being and make it sentient, then man, that's really something. And, and he goes on down in verse um, 
28, for in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's device. If, so Paul just is used, if you are alive, then what makes you think that you could be the creation of a God that's dead. How can something that's dead make something that's alive? Well, I, <laughs> you can't. You can't. So, if, if, as, as much as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's device. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. So God, yeah, okay, let the Gentiles out there, let them kind of wander around thinking that, you know, this, this tree they cut down and decked with silver and gold, let them think that that's, that's God. But now, he commands all men everywhere, you got to figure out who the true God is. And isn't it interesting, in today's culture, what is considered really progressive, forward thinking? Is it to worship the one true God? Or is it to say, hey, everything's okay, right? Whatever you believe, as long as it's your truth, it's okay. Scripture presents exactly the opposite of that. Scripture says, you know, <clears throat> that the times of ignorance are when you were out there worshiping all kinds of wacky gods. But if you really want to move forward, it's time to understand who the one true God is. But today, if you talk about the one true God, and that that one true God is the giver of life and all the rest, then guess what? You're, you're, you're just an old-fashioned, fuddy-duddy, whatever. But Paul says, you need to move on from that ignorance, because God now commands all men everywhere to repent. So, we have this God that is alive, and a God that is a giver of life. Ooh, it's 10 to 12 already. And, 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 and then we have these idols. And the thing that's true about idols, go back to, to Isaiah chapter 2. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 2. One of the things that is true about idols, in fact, the thing that is true about idols above all others, is that, well, I'll just read the verse. Isaiah chapter 2 and look at verse 8. The land, their land also is full of idols. This is talking about Israel and, and what they've done. Uh, verse, verse 7, their land also is full of silver and gold, neither is there any end of their treasures. Their land also is full of horses, neither is there any end of their chariots. Their land also is full of idols. They worship the work of their own hands, that which their own fingers have made. That's the problem. That's what, an, at its very heart, that's what idolatry is. It's worshiping the work of your own hands. Verse 9, the mean man boweth down, the great man humbleth himself, therefore forgive them. So the great man, a great man will bow down and humble himself before the work of his own hands. So you make something, you know, you make a podium, make whatever, and then you say, you know that thing I just made? <laughs> That's God. So if you made God, then who are you? <laughs> you're, you're, you're like a ultra God or super God or something because you made God. And, and that's really the heart of what idolatry is, to take something that you make with your own hands and say, this thing is God, the work of your own hands. Go over to the 31st chapter of Isaiah, and we'll, we're going to run very many verses because we're running short on time, but this is another one of those phrases, Isaiah 31 and verse 7. For in that day every man shall cast away his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which your own hands have made unto you for a sin. <clears throat> that, that Just like living God is all through the scripture, the work of your own hands. That's all, that's all through the scripture when, when talking about idolatry. It's worshiping the work of your own. It's you creating God. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 10. Jeremiah chapter 10. And some people, they'll take a verse like this and, and say, well, see, that's, 
a Christmas tree. And um, I personally don't think it is, but, you know, whatever. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 10, because if you read this, <clears throat> Hear ye the word of the Lord, which the Lord speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, learn, learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of the heathen, or uh, signs of heaven rather, for uh, the heathen are dismayed at them. For the customs of the people are vain. One cutteth a tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen with the axe. They deck it with silver and with gold. They fasten it with nails and with hammers that it move not. Uh, they are upright as a palm tree, but speak not. They must needs be born because they cannot go. Be not afraid of them. They, can, uh, they cannot do evil, neither also is in them to do good. You know, we read this passage earlier about the, 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 the work of uh, the customs of the people and cutting down the tree and the work uh, of the workmen and all of that. And what does it all mean? Well, let's get another verse. Go over to uh, Isaiah chapter 41. Isaiah 41. Isaiah chapter 41. There's a passage in Isaiah 41 um, that talks about <clears throat> this, this, same, this same issue. Isaiah 41. And verse, um, uh, verse 6. Isaiah 41 verse 6. They helped everyone his neighbor and every one said to his brother, Be of good courage. So the carpenter encouraged the goldsmith, and he that smootheth with the hammer, uh, with him that smote the anvil, saying, It is ready for the soldering. And he fastened it with nails, that it should not be moved. So what are they doing with all these things? Well, they're taking these, these things out of the forest, the trees out of the forest, and they're fast, and they're carving them, the work of the workman, that's what he's doing, he's carving it, and then they're decking it with silver and gold. What does it mean to deck something? We would call it gold-plated. Um, if, if, if you can't afford to have a solid gold idol, then what do you do? If you can't, if you can't afford a solid gold ring or whatever, then you get one that's like made out of brass or something and you gold plate it. You say, look at my gold ring or look at my gold silver, gold silverware. No, look at my goldware, look at my whatever. Or if you have silverware, sterling silver is real silver, but silver plated, ah, it's not so, you know. And so they, if you can't afford a golden idol, you take a piece of wood and you fasten it that it can't be moved and you, you hire the workman and he makes this and he decks it with silver and gold and he solders all the joints and you say, look at my golden whatever that I worship. And they worship those things and if you go to the book of Psalms you see the, the idea behind it. Psalm chapter 115. And in Psalm 115 what they're doing is making an image. Remember how God said back in Exodus, make no image of anything in heaven above or earth beneath or in the waters under the earth. Here's the image that they're making, Psalm chapter 115, because the images that they're making have all the features, verse um, 4, uh, Psalm 116, 4. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Noses have they, but they smell not. They have hands but they handle not. Feet have they, but they walk not. Neither speak they through their throat. They that make them are like unto them, so is everyone that trusteth in them. So these idols that they're making, it's not just, you know, I know some people will take these verses and say, oh, see, when you bring a Christmas tree in, that's a bale pole, and da 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 That's not what's going on in the Old Testament. They're making images. Thou shalt make no graven image. They're making images of things that, that are, they're dead, they're a dead image, but they attribute to them Godhood. It's the work of my own hands. And it's got a, I love this passage in Psalm 115. It ha, they have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Noses have they, but they smell not. They have hands, but they handle not. Feet have they, but they walk not. Neither speak they through their throats. So it's pretty clear. It's the image of, of, some, of a man or some kind of creature. And we're worshiping that image. But you know what? That image has all the right parts, 
But what about those parts? They have mouths, but they speak not. Does God speak in Scripture? God speaks all the time, doesn't he? They have ears, but they hear not. Does God hear the prayers of his people? Yeah, he does. So all, all these, you know, they have feet, but they, can go, they can't go anywhere. They go not. Well, can God go? Does he get around pretty good? Yeah, he gets around pretty good. So th this passage in Psalms, it's like a, it's like a mockery. It's like, you, you, you people, you're making these things and you're just, listen to what Paul says. Go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And this, this, this word, I think, I think it means a certain thing, but I think it's neat to think about it means something else too. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2. 1 Corinthians 12, 2, Paul says this, Ye know... He says to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 12, 2, Ye know that ye were Gentiles carried away unto these dumb idols, even as ye were led. Now that word dumb, I think probably in the immediate context it means can't speak. Because that's what, that's what the psalmist says. Hey, they have mouths and throats, but they can't speak. So they're dumb idols, they can't speak. But, but another way it's kind of neat to read it is, they're just dumb. <laughs> if you worship an idol, guess what? You're dumb. You're just dumb to worship something that is dead. The work of your own hands. When God is a God that's alive, and, and the thing that's, that's, that, that really is hard for mankind to, to accept and grasp about God is, I had nothing to do with him. <laughs> I had nothing to do with his plan of salvation. I had nothing to do with Christ's coming. I had nothing. I had, it's all God. It's the work of his hands. And mankind doesn't like that. That's why we make idols. And while we don't, you know, and Paul even says, when Paul talks about idolatry in 1 Corinthians 8, we know that an idol is nothing in this world. They're God's many and Lord. Don't, don't, get all, don't get yourself all in a tizzy about idols and whether something is offered to an idol or whatever. Don't just, it's nothing. It's nothing. But he does say this. Go to Colossians chapter 3. The, 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 the issue where idolatry comes in for us is going back to that definition. Something may... Excuse me, with your own hands. Colossians 3, verse 1. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth, for ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, Christ who is our life. So we have a living God. Not only is that God living, but he can give life, and in fact has given life to us, Christ who is our life. So our life now, you know, what we were is gone. Our life is in him who is the giver of life. When Christ who is our life, verse 4, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is what? Idolatry. idolatry. Covetousness, which is idolatry. So what is covetous? I thought, well, you know, we, we all think, don't covet, don't. But it, here's the definition of covetousness. A strong or an ordinate desire of obtaining and possessing some supposed good. Usually of wealth <coughs> or uh, uh, possessing wealth or a greediness, insatiable desire of gain. And then, so the word inordinate kept coming up. An inordinate desire, an inordinate desire, an inordinate affection. In fact, he has that in this verse, right? Inordinate affection. So I thought, what does inordinate mean? It means irregularly, disorderly, or excessive, immoderate. Paul says, let your moderation be known to all men. If your desire is immoderate, disorderly and excessive, it then becomes inordinate. It's not according to order. So if you have an inordinate desire for th covetousness is an inordinate, excessive desire for some perceived good. The work of whose hands? Your own hands. And Paul says, 
covetousness, which is idol. See, you're, the idols today that, that we have to worry about are not so much, hey, there's a statue over there, I'm going to go leave a, leave a peach for him. <laughs> nah, the, you know, yes, in parts of the world, but in America, in the Western world, it's not, you know, not, but what is the Western world just totally enamored with? Money. Money. Stuff. Our, our silver and gold, it's not that we want a silver and gold decked idol. We want some silver and gold bars in the bank, right? Or under our mattress or wherever. That's what we want. And, but it's still, go back to that definition of idol. You worship the work of your own hands. That which your own fingers have made. And that's the definition. And that's what Paul's getting to here. He, Paul even says, idols... Ah, not that big a deal. But covetousness, an inordinate desire for stuff, an inordinate excessive desire for stuff. Inordinate, it's, it's excessive. So, and that's why Paul says, let your moderation be known to all men. Wanting something is not covetousness. An inordinate excessive desire for that thing Becomes and where do you cross that line? Well, that's a that's a good question. You can debate that for a long time, but at some point it becomes covetousness instead of just a desire to have a house, some food, whatever the case might be. But when it crosses that line to covetousness, now Paul says you've also crossed the line to idolatry, and it's all about the work of our own hand. What's what's more valuable to us? That which we have in Christ, which we had nothing to do with except to say, thank you, Lord. Or that which we've produced with our own hands, the work of our own hands. That's where idolatry is today. And we just need to remember to stay focused. And this time of the year, we think about the gift of Jesus Christ. We had nothing to do with it. He came in a manger. God gave his son, gave him to die ultimately on the cross. All of that is the work of his hands. All of that is the plan that he conceived. All of that that Christ did was what he did, the work of his hands, the work in his life that he did, not us. And it's keeping that in balance, the work of his hands versus the work of our hands. And the work of his hands is what's important, much more important than the work of our hands. And the work of our hands is idolatry, the work of his hands is spirituality. Let's bow our hearts down a word of prayer. God and Father, again, we do thank you for Jesus Christ, for the opportunity of looking to your word this morning and studying it together. We thank you that he did give to us the gift of his son, uh, not just to be born in a manger, but to die on a cross, to provide us redemption, salvation, forgiveness, and deliverance from our sins. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.